morning. You will turn with me to Isaiah 9, and verses 1 through 7. We're going to read those this morning. Isaiah 9, 1 through 7. But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea, on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation, you shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence. As with the gladness of, har of, of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor at the, bat as a, uh, at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning, fuel for the fire. For a child will, bo will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. I'm more nervous today than any other day of my life because it's the first day of the week. It's the day the Lord has made, and we should rejoice and be glad in it. And I hope my message today will bring rejoicing and gladness to your heart. You know, we, we look at a world who sits at the foot of a tree and, and sees the presence and are grateful for the presence. And, hey, I raise both my hands. I love doing that too. But I can't let my mind forget about the great tree that was lit up with the body of Christ hanging on it. You know, as, as the Bible talks about, people were seeking or searching, some versions say, the Christ. Herod sent him out, remember? Go find that boy. Go find this king so I can go worship him. Ah, that ain't what he meant. So he sent them out, Matthew chapter 1. And I want us to go over there, Matthew chapter 1, or Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, verse 9 uh, says, After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had been, seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceeding, exceedingly with great joy. You know, there was a, a group that went searching, and I believe, I believe with all my heart today, somebody's searching for Christ. And the bright light that's going to shine over him is God's truth. And that's what we're going to talk about today. That great Christ that was born. I remember one time out at a campaign, we were um, given some addresses to go look up and find, right? And we were looking for this address down this old country road and back in the back hills um, of a town in Arkansas. And we, we, we found the town. And we were in the time, we, we couldn't locate the road, right? So we go to the fire department. They never heard of the road. We went to the police department said, we're looking for this road. I said, man, I ain't never heard of that road. We went to see, I mean, hear me out. We even went to City Hall trying to find this road. Ain't nobody ever heard of that road. We saw a young man on the street and asked him, have you ever heard of that road? If he knew where it was, he got out his map and he pointed on that map directly where this road was. I said, well, thank you, man. That's, that's pretty cool that you would know that. Ain't nobody else in this town. I said, were you with the police department and fire department? He said, no, I'm a pizza delivery man. How many people today do we know today, right now, in your mind, can you think, are looking for Christ but just don't know the way? The world's fooling him. He's at the foot of a tree. He's in that presence. We talked about the tree, but 
He's not in the present. He's in our presence. He's with us. Where two or three are gathered, and I know this is out of context when we're talking about worship, the idea that when two or three are gathered, it's talking about going out to our brethren and helping them out of their sin. And that's a very difficult thing. But the principle applies. When we are together, when we are the Lord's church, when we are worshiping, he is amongst us. And I pray for anybody that's here today that aren't members of the church of Christ, have not been added to the church because you don't join the church. Acts chapter 2 is very clear. God adds you to the church. Once you receive his word and are baptized, the Lord adds you to his church. We want that for you because we know where Christ is. And we want to show you. Not because we are scholarly, but because we are biblical. God's word is found in the Bible, the true word of God. And knowing the way will get us to Christ. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And that's what we are, are following, the way, truth, and life. Now get it back over to uh, uh, our, our scripture today. Isaiah chapter 9, and we look at verses 1 through 7, we talk about that. But I want to really focus on, on verse 6, because verse 6 is where it really, really introduces this wonderful child of Christ to us. Now, you're going to go home. I know some of y'all probably left your presents unwrapped, or, or, or left them wrapped, and you waited until after services to go home and go get to them. But let me tell you, you're leaving here today with the greatest gift you can ever receive, and that is God's life. The greatest gift ever given to us is the life that God offers through Christ Jesus. And I hope we see it that way. Because without that life, we're dead to God. And I know we may be breathing and existing upon this world, but folks, when we don't have the life that God offers to us in Christ, we're dead to him. And so we want to look at the incarnation through Isaiah's eyes. What do we say? About seven or 800 years before Christ is born, he's telling us about the incarnation. God coming to earth. Are you hearing me? God himself coming to earth. I said, come, how do you know that? Do you remember what the psalmist said? Thank you, God, for visiting the earth. How did God visit the earth? Through Christ Jesus, the incarnation. Then we're going to talk about the impact. Boom. You talk about Wow, oh, bang. Remember old John Madden? He would describe football like that. That's the way God describes our life. Pow. Boom. Oop, there it is. Right? The life that God gives us is in Christ Jesus. The illumination. Who is this Christ? Who is this one that you seek? Now we will find. And we will let his rule guide our life. You remember when the book of Genesis started? When God looked in the world, there was what? Chaos. There was, there was nothing. There was just confusion. And what did he do? His word. He spoke and brought it all together. Now, that's, you understand me, that's the physical side. Old Testament, physical side. Here's the, here's the spiritual side. When Jesus was born, where was the world? In total chaos. Are you hearing me? Total chaos. And so Jesus came into the world to set things right. Not right according to you. Not right according to Jack. But right according to God. He wants us to understand. He created this world through Jesus, for Jesus, and he shared it with us. And when Jesus created it, when it all came to order, it had order. It had significance. It had power. It had beauty. It had all the greatness. And, and all those things are still there when Christ is where he's supposed to be. Yes, he was born in the world. But how many people say, I have no room for him? Remember the birth? At the end, no room. What about in you? Is there room for him? This is the question that has to be in our lap. And as we look at this great gift that was given to us, go to verse 6. For a child will be born to us, will be born to us. He's not born yet, but he's going to be born, according to Isaiah. That's what I said, seven, eight hundred years. 
That's a great prophecy. And look at this, child and born. Why does, and God is so wonderful. And sometimes we miss it. The words child and the word born show it uh, as a physical birth. This is going to be a physical birth. And we know how Jesus was conceived through the Holy Spirit, right? Mary, who accepted this great offer, and although she was very perplexed by it, I'm sure, she accepted it because it was from God. A son shows divinity. In the Hebrew language, in the Hebrew understanding of, of the word son, means equality with somebody. The Son of God is in equality with God. Why did the Jews want to kill Jesus? Why, why were they so upset with him? Well, they, they, they uh, blamed him of blasphemy. Why? Because he said he was equal with God, a Son of God. I am the Son of God. And so when the Hebrew writer, I mean, the, uh, Isaiah wrote for us, he reminded us, that a son shows a physical birth of God upon this earth, which is kind of hard for us to understand. So when we, when we get all this together, when we start realizing how great this day is, we see that God's gift to us is his willingness. Are you hearing me? His willingness. This great God, this creator, this master of the universe has allowed himself to come to earth to identify with you and I. And I love how Paul describes that in Philippians chapter 2. That he would allow him say himself to be made in the likeness of men as a servant. A servant that only God could come and be. See, the, the, the big thing about the word son here is the ancient people, they wanted a son. They always wanted to have a son because sons carry on the name. Right? My, my name is carried on through my, the, you know, my son. And in the original language, it gave uh, a picture of a tent and a seed. You know, when they, the, when they drew stuff on pictures of it instead of words, they drew a picture of a seed in a tent. In other words, to keep his household going. Jesus came to this world, to this earth, to continue the, the, the seed of who Christ is. And that seed is the offspring of his family. That's us, folks. So not only was Christ prophesied seven to 800 years before he was born, the church itself, Sun Valley Congregation, was talked about, thought about, and prophesied through the scriptures. So God planted that seed of life upon this earth. And the question we have to ask is, has he been born in us? You remember John chapter one, verse 12, he said, those who receive me, they have the right to become children of God. It's just not an automatic thing. You have the right to become children of God. And who is this great Jesus? Well, you remember, he invited us. All who are weary and heavy laden, come to me, and I will give you rest. So when we see this child, when we think of Jesus, we must look at the prescription that he has for distress. All who are weary and heavy laden. The pattern for a new life. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21 remind us how important this wonderful life is. In 1 Corinthians 1 verse 11, Paul said, Imitate me as I imitate cub. No! Imitate me as I what? Imitate Christ. I follow Christ. The pattern for life. The power, folks. Hear me out. The power to make our example effective. And you say, well, how, how is that, Cub? Philippians 4.13. I can do, we serve a can-do God. You hearing me? I can do just about everything. No! All things through Christ who strengthens me. That's important. We need to show the world that we can do, that we will do. Why? Because the incarnation of Christ has been born in us. 
your life is showing that right now today as you're sitting in here listening to a wonderful lesson from God's word. Not wonderful because it's coming from Cub. Wonderful because it's coming from God's word. And you chose today to spend this day doing that, listening to that, God's gift. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. And, and he is the radiance of the glory and the exact representation of his nature. Are we hearing it? And upholds all things by the word of his power. When he made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Think about what that just said. The radiance of God. What does that mean? The radiance of God. It's like the reflected brightness. Anybody that's been out to a lake when the lake is still, calm, and you look at your reflection in the water, that's exactly what that word is saying. The exact representation of who God is. The character. We get our word character from that. It's God quality in Christ Jesus. And uphold the power of his word. What Jesus speaks, what Jesus says, holds his church together. Now, why is the world falling apart? Because they don't listen to his word. They come up with their own plan. They have their own power. They're living for their own purpose. You and I get to show the world how important this wonderful birth in us really is. The incarnation. A teacher one time teaching a class how plants grow, right? And so she gave them all these seeds to plant in their classroom. And, and she went a few days and they were all watering these seedlings and stuff. But she noticed one of them didn't sprout. So she went over and planted a seed for that, you know, replaced the seed. And uh, she said to the class, let's, let's look at our seeds. And, and one boy just was flabbergasted. He said, look, teacher, look. She, he said, look, it's a miracle. This plant is growing. And the teacher said, yeah. Plants growing, that's pretty exciting. And the student said, no, teacher, I'm real. It's a miracle because I ate my seed and it's still growing. Now you think about that. What, what I said, because God wants us to digest. Remember John, eat this book. Ezekiel, eat this scroll. God wants us to digest. John chapter 6, those who eat of my flesh, drink. He wants us to digest his word and let that seed grow. And continue to bring fruit to the world so they can see what? See Christ in us. Now Jesus is born in us. When that incarnation takes place. When God coming to this earth changes life. Yeah? What about the impact? What impact did it have? A son will be given to us and the government. Woohoo! We got it all solved. The government will rest on his shoulders. The problem is it ain't talking about the United States government or the world's government. It's talking about the government of God. It's going to rest on his shoulders. You know, the world, God saw the world in need. He didn't see, he didn't, uh, Mike, he didn't send a, an accountant. He didn't see, send an athlete. He sent his son. Who allows the government to rest upon his shoulder. Folks, we have to take our minds off this world's tragedy of what we call government. And look at God's government. God sent his gift, his son, to keep his house going upon earth. Matthew chapter 1. Going back to that passage. Matthew chapter 1. It's a wonderful passage because no, if you look over there, Matthew chapter 1, look at verse 21. She will bear a son. There it is, right? 800 years, it happened. Imagine that. God knows what he's talking about. Huh? She, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus came to earth to take away sin, folks. When he's born in us, that sin is washed away. That sin now holds no power. Oh, death. Where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, sting of death, the sin, bam, gone. No sin, no death, no power. Why? Because that's the impact of that gift. 
when that, when that Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is born in our heart and washed, and we are dressed and clothed in Christ, Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, takes away that sin. He testifies to God's faithfulness. Look at verse 22. Now all this took place to do what? Fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with a child and she shall bear her son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. That birth testify to you and me and to all the people of Israel and all the people of the world before, that God is faithful. It also assures us that God is with us, verse 23. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. It's a great impact. A great impact in this world. Because what it's done is open our mind to to the church. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, Paul said, He made known to us, who's us? The church. The mystery of His will, according to His kind intention, which He purposed in Him, with a view to an administration, a government, suitable to the fullness of times. That is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things that are on earth, in Him. The impact of that gift. God planted his church with that seed. And now you and I are the impact, and, and we are impacting this world today. You being here is making an impact with somebody in your life. They'll say, you know, they'll say, Scott, where were you on Christmas Day? Scott said, well, I was up leading the Lord's Supper. Worshiping my God. Impact. That's the impact God wants us to have upon this earth. To share that wonderful testimony. To give life to the dead. That's the impact of Christ. We were once dead in our trespasses. Ephesian letter. Now we were washed. We were sanctified. We were justified through the blood of the Lamb. Let's continue to make an impact in this world. Using today maybe as the benchmark. Because as Paul knows, the world sees this as the day that Christ was born. We see it as a chance for the Christ to be born in them today. To make that impact. That's our Lord. And that's what that seed in us does. It gives us that strength to illuminate. To show who this wonderful Christ is. And when hearts are open and folks... One of the greatest things that we can see in people is a beautiful heart. I've said it to you. I've said it to others. You have a beautiful heart. And that's what God wants to operate in. You know, minds and hearts sometimes don't work together good. That's what Christ does. He brings that illumination of who Jesus truly is. And if you look at, um, go back over to, Isaiah 9, and we look at verse 6, and he says, and his name. And see, we, we as human beings, especially as American human beings, we don't think much of a name. It's a tag. It's, you know, call him cub, call him whatever you want. Just don't call me late for dinner, right? The idea here is when God says a name, it means everything that God is. His name is everything. Everything is in the name gives the idea of his nature, gives the idea of what he's about. And he says, we'll be called. And that's important because all the qualities of who God is will meet right here in Jesus. Isn't that powerful stuff? We can be illuminated with this powerful, this wonderful Jesus. Look how God illuminated who this child to be born, not born yet, but to be born in this, can you imagine that? It, and it, I, it, still, it still blows my mind that God, the great creator, would lower himself to a feeding trough. I know we call it a manger, but it was a feeding trough for hogs and pigs and donkeys because he wanted us to see 
the full nature of who he is. Come, take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am what? Lowly. I am humble. I am meek. God wants us to see the greatness of his name. And he shows us to us in the way that he described him here. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Now, I know that sounds pretty cool, but what, you know, what, what impact does that have? How is that illuminated? Well, what he's saying is there's going to be judgment coming to this world one day, and this is going to be the one that will show you how to stay out of that judgment and into God's life. Wonderful counselor. Mighty God. Mighty God. That shows authority. When, when, when you looked at this word in, in the pictures that they drew about this word, it would show a finger pointing and a river flowing in that direction. That's God's authority. He's mighty. He's the one that points the direction for the rivers to flow the waters to flow, for the sun to rise, for the stars to shine. Where were you when I hung the stars? In the heavens, God asked Job. In other words, don't forget I'm authority. I got all things under my control. I am the mighty God. And, you know, you, we talked about Jesus and his yoke. The idea of the mighty God here is like a support system of a yoked together oxen yoked together they yoke the stronger with the younger so god the stronger yoked to christ the younger are you hearing that do you see the picture painted this book is beautiful folks this is powerful stuff and here's the thing of that when the, the when the stronger one he's the authority he's the mighty one excuse me for hollering i get excited about this like craig charles got to reel him back in He's the mighty one. And look at this. When we break that yoke, we die. He's no longer our authority. He no longer rules in our life. The eternal father. He's gathering, the word actually means he gathers all to a meeting place. He gathers everybody to come and stand before him in judgment. And what this has done, what Isaiah, I don't know about you, but what he has done for me is give me the assurance of the importance of a proper relationship with this son that is going to be born. Then he tops it off. I'm a chocolate cake lover, but you put some whipped cream on that thing and it's just double good. You understand? Here's the whipped cream. He's the prince of peace. The Prince of Peace, again, shows authority. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. Are we hearing that? God's gift came. The idea is the Prince of Peace, when it's a, your head should turn to him. He's authority. Your head should look away from everything else that's trying to lead you away from God or lead you away from that peace. And if you understand that word peace in the Hebrew language, it means to be complete. You know why the world is having so much problems? Because they're incomplete. You and I, because of this wonderful birth, in us, not so much in the world. In the world, yes, it's beautiful that he came. He, uh, 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 Paul wrote to Titus and told him that grace of God has appeared to all men, bringing salvation to all men. Uh-oh, but not all men will stay yoked or even take that yoke and see the trueness of having a great God and Prince of Peace, an e eternal Father working in their lives. You know, God sent his son to light up our life. Cassie, you're glowing. You are a glowing girl. You know that? Because Christ is born in you. A son is born unto you. And what a light it truly is. It's a heart that is letting God plant his seed in, in each and every one of us. The incarnation of that gift is letting Jesus be born in us. I know he's born in the world. It says that. But is he born in you? 
You remember when the disciples were walking and, and Jesus said, who do they say that I am? And he cut them off about mid-sins. They said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me ask you something. Who do you say that I am? The influence of the gift. He wants to govern our life. Because when we govern our own life, we fall away from God. We follow our own wisdom instead of God. And then the illumination of the gift is, folks, <laughs> let's continue to let God shine through each and every one of us. I have seen God's gift right here at Sun Valley. Me and my family, we are blessed to be here and be part of this wonderful family. And we thank each and every one of you for letting God shine through each and every one of you. Now, I want to encourage you today. If you're here, are you shining? Have you let God take away your sin? That darkness that keeps light from shining. If you're here and you're not being baptized into Christ, I pray you'll make that decision so God can wash away that sin and you can walk out of this building today shining for God. And how bright are we shining? Being here is not enough. Loving God is not enough. When we love God, we hate darkness. Satan uses the darkness to get our focus out of whack. If there's something in your life that Satan's trying to use to get your focus out of whack, let's give it to God. Let's let him clean it away so your light can shine brighter. If we can help you today, please take this opportunity to come forward as we stand and we sing.